All right, so there's a movie that I've been really wanting to talk about for a while. And because of this, because it's known in our circle how I feel about this movie, you, you, have, been, you have brought it up, Owen's brought it up, it's been like the whole thing. And so it's like, it's kind of, it's kind of a, I don't know if you want to say spoiler or sorts or whatever, um, before we talk about what we like about each one. I feel like it's worth noting right away that one of these movies is the movie that I've always considered the funniest movie of all time. Like whenever it's it's in, like it's interesting to me that I even have an answer to that question because it seems like there should be so many options and there are. But I'm just so comfortable in saying this is my answer. Mm -hmm. I feel I feel like it's pretty obvious because. <laughs> Because I would be, I would have defended Sandler much more in the past if I thought one of his movies was the funniest movie of all time. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I might, I might go a little easier on him if that were the case. <laughs> um, despite the fact that that movie is also its own thing, but um, the thing about it was, we brought up what about Bob, and it's like, man, wouldn't it be great to do that with something? But I just never knew what to do it with. Mm -hmm. And you were searching it, or no, it was Anger Mansion that got brought up. Yeah. And then you were like, oh, what could we do with that, I wonder? And when you're, you just laughed and you said, hey, this, and you showed me your phone. Uh huh. And then it was like, it, it looked like you were going to dismiss it. Like you were like, oh, well, that's probably not close enough. But it's like, it is. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've got the comedic actor as the patient, and then you've got the very respected Oscar-winning actor as the therapist that gets the funniest performance, by far. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, obviously Murray is amazing in his own right. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I feel like what Dreyfus does and what about Bob is next level, comedic wise. <laughs> <laughs> but before we go into that, I think we decided we want to start with anger management. Yeah. And then go into because we don't know how long what about Bob's going to take to talk about. <laughs> like it, mm -hmm. it almost worries me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for for all the good reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, for the, the first thing we need to say about anger management is we need to shout out to Owen and say that if he were here, he would say anger management is all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really weird. Mm -hmm. It's weird that a movie like Anger Management has a giant twist. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> but um, but at the same time, it does. Like once you see it, it does make sense. Like how everything went the way it did without different consequences. Yeah, because I remember when I first saw the movie. I was I would have been like what twelve? This was like probably in the summer area of two thousand thirteen. Mm, two thousand three, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um and even at twelve, I remember thinking, that's really far fetched. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um but yeah, it's it is weird how much it adds up. But I, I do like the one person that wasn't involved. Wasn't it like the air marshal was like the only one that wasn't involved? <laughs> yeah, he was just having a bad day. <laughs> So, my only my only thing with the twist is if Buddy Rydell knows that many people around New York that he could set something up like that, how the hell has Dave Busnick never heard of him? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, well, of course, there's, there's actually quite a few people like that. Like, there's that guy that um, my, I can't remember his damn name now. It's going to slip my mind. Mike Myers made a documentary about a guy that was well known in Hollywood and he was like hit like his house was like the ultimate party spot and he knew like everybody but the public didn't know who he was. Oh. Hmm. So there's quite a few people like that. So it could be, but they're they're usually like producers or something. <laughs> yeah. I do I do like that it's almost like an in joke in itself that somebody like that amongst all these people would be uh, a therapist of all people. <laughs> yeah. So, um, should we just talk about, should we just go right into Jack? Because he's obviously, sure. 
he's obviously the star of the show. Yeah. And he's your favorite actor, so do you want to throw out some thoughts first? I'd say you start with um, like how you felt about it when the movie first came out. Was he already your favorite actor when the movie came out? Because I know it, it kind of happened while you were in college when you got that assignment on Cuckoo's Nest. I think it's around the time you became your favorite actor, is that right? Yeah. I can't remember if this came if this was like in that area or before or after. Or... No, this was before. <laughs> so, for, so at the time, it was more like this was the Joker at the time. I think that's pretty much what I said and told everybody. And he, and he busts out the Joker laugh more than once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's almost eerie how much the Joker laugh comes out when he's laughing at Tomcats on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> I will say this. I think for for somebody that you think, like on the surface, has it all together, and then underneath you find might be deranged. They, I mean, the casting's perfect. <laughs> I mean, there really wasn't anybody else that you could get. <laughs> the, best, the best thing about this, when you say it, when you put it that way, is the way he's able to change. It's mm-hmm. like he's such an unpredictable character. Two scenes come to mind. The egg scene? Yeah, and I love that it's in one shot. Like, if I remember correctly, we don't cut away and then cut back. He throws it and he, he screams, I said over easy. And then we cut to Sam reacting. And then when we cut back to Jack, he's still angry. And then we watch him morph into, like, now why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I love we got it in one shot, the morph back into smiling happy <laughs> mm-hmm. and the other one of my favorites is one of his first lines uh-huh. he's so angelic and inviting when we first see him and he says this seat's available and we get like slow-mo of him smiling mm-hmm. and he seems so friendly and chatty and he's like you know no air what a bummer and then it escalates so quickly when he sees his arm on the armrest and it just turns into, we're not going to have problems, are we? <laughs> <laughs> the, the wording of some of his lines is the best part. <laughs> <laughs> like um, the same scene when he sees the actress in Tomcats. Mm-hmm. He over and says, what is your position on uh, breast implants? My favorite part of that line is the other. <laughs> <laughs> what is your position on uh, breast implant? <laughs> it, like the great thing about Jack's lines is so many of so many of them seem improvised. Like I don't know how many of them are, mm-hmm. but just the way he delivers them makes them feel that way. <laughs> like I, think, I mean, the, the man helps a fart joke land. Yeah, I think I heard somewhere that that was improvised because you can literally see Sandler laughing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure, did you hear that frog was improvised? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's always so great because people always talk about how it's hard, it, like it's, it seems like it's easier for comedic actors to do drama. See Sandler recently with Uncut Downs. Mm-hmm. Um, or Punch Drunk Love, which he had just done with Luis Guzman the year before this. <laughs> yeah. But then they say it's a much harder for serious actors to do comedy. Mm-hmm. So when you see performances like this, or try to somewhat about Bob, mm-hmm. it makes them all the more triumphant and in how insanely funny they are. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, did, you, did you want to have more stuff? Someone, I, I would say that, you know, with, with Dreyfus and Nicholson, you have old school examples. I think somebody that is a younger actor, more from this generation, that also does very well from flip-flopping between dramatic and comedy is Channing Tatum. Yeah. Channing Tatum is hilarious. Yeah, 21 Jump Street was like a full-on revelation. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I've said this many times about Channing Tatum. When he jumps through the gong in Twenty One Jump Street, was a huge turning point for me. Personally. <laughs> <laughs> it was because, like, he does step up, and you're like, "Oh, he's going to be the guy that's always in those kind of movies." 
And now whenever I see Channing Tatum is going to be in a movie, I'm like, there's a good chance this movie is going to be good. Yeah, and when, when he jumped through the gong, mm-hmm. he was only two years away from Fox Country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technically one year because Fox Country got pushed. But, uh... <laughs> he also does pretty well at small roles like uh, Kingsman 2, Hateful Eight. He's really good for, like, the two scenes he gets. Yeah, and when, when we brought this up, obviously he's older than Tatum, or, well... No, they're, they're closer than I remember. Mm-hmm. Like, like I keep saying, Tatum's always older than I remember. Um, I thought you were going to say DiCaprio. But... I'm, wait, I'm waiting for him to do like a full-on bust-out comedy role because I think he would excel. Yeah. I'm waiting for it. And it just seems like it's just not his cup of tea. But what's interesting is there will be people that tell you that what the Wall Street wants on Hollywood are comics. And rip, rip. Yeah, you, you do get a lot of it in those two movies. Like, those two movies, is like, it's like a sneak peek of what could be. And it's like, it's always great to see those, but when you look at a Jack or a Dreyfus that has so much drama underneath them, which, Dreyfus is a different case, because Dreyfus has, has done many comedies. Like, his, the movie Dreyfus won his Oscar for is one of his mm-hmm. funniest, it's probably his second funniest performance after this one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And while Jack, Jack has had, like, you know, it's, you could say that about as good as it gets as a comedy that he won an Oscar for, but it, mm-hmm. there's so many dramatic beats in that performance. Yeah. But it's like to, for him to just be able to go full blown. Garrett Breedlove is a relatively comedic character, too. And I guess, yeah, I guess all three of them. Technically. He's always we, all, we, all, we always quote the, you're parked in my driveway, you're breaking the law. <laughs> But there's always, there's a lot of his roles have an underlying comedy element, but we hadn't really seen it in this fashion, if no. I remember right. Like he, no, he, McMurphy's, uh, McMurphy's another one that has funny things that happen. And he had even done comedies like The Witches of Eastwick. Mm-hmm. And shitty movies like Man Trouble. <laughs> <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> but it's like, for to get, to get a role like this felt like it's so interesting i mean the, the, you think about the one time he played a clown it was a murder clown <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it's so interesting to see somebody with a career as fast as his like if you go to like the low budget roger Corman era of the 60s you'll find like a billion movie season mm-hmm. they're off the radar and to have such a long career, and in 2003, to be able to find another side of the dice that is his career, mm-hmm. it's, like, <laughs> it's amazing. Mm-hmm. And it's and, and it was like, I remember being really like kind of surprising at the time, like I said, even though he had been in comedies before, it was the, it was the role that like really made it. And I know it's gonna sound funny to say, but with his quick turns, like his very like, like his quick mood turns, do you see a do you see quite a bit of Buddy Rydell and Frank Costello? <laughs> like when he, when he has this, because Frank Costello, like Buddy Rydell, is a very unpredictable character. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, the, and they're they're unpredictable in the same ways. Either they're either they're joking around or whatever. Frank's jokes are a little darker, but still. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then they can just turn immediately. Mm-hmm. His when he says, I, "I said over easy," is in the same voice as the same reality TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but and then there's there's some moments that are like, I wish I didn't know so much. Because, and it's a, that sounds like a weird thing to say, especially for what I'm talking about. I've seen Tom Cats, the movie they're watching on the plane. Mm-hmm. And it's a hilarious joke when he says, you better get your headset, you're missing your four plot points. And it's just them sitting in the shower. Mm-hmm. But it's like, if I remember correctly, somewhere around that scene, Jake Busey's character in Tom Cats reveals that he has testicular cancer. So, hmm. so Buddy might have been actually serious when he said that. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what's funnier. 
if, if Buddy were being serious when he said that, or the joke of just them sitting in the shower not speaking. If Buddy's saying you're missing it, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> So, well, unless you have more to add on Nicholson, do you? I'm sure he'll keep. Popping. I think it's pretty well summed up. I mean, we're going to come across it again. He's throughout the entire movie. So we say that much about Nicholson. So the big question now is, how do you feel about Sandler? Well, when you see the movies that Sandler was doing up to that point, it, it is a funny concept that his character needs anger management, but not for the reason you think. Yeah. And like even when you talk about his comedies like Happy Gilmore and Billy Mass and all these they got anger issues. Mm -hmm. But even just before his serious work with Punch Drunk Love, Barry Egan had a huge anger problem. Mm -hmm. And that was a more or less serious role for him. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, to go into I I think that might be something I've never even thought about. Really? That was <laughs> one of the first things I thought. <laughs> That, like, anger is his forte, and then when he's has he plays the character that's in anger management, he's so calm. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, like, like when uh, Nicholson describes the two kinds of angry people, in every other Sandler movie, he's the first kind. <laughs> and then in this one, he's the cashier. I do love the line, no, I'm the guy that's hiding in the person who's section like dialing 911. <laughs> There's a lot of funny little one-liners in this movie like i would say that overall nicholson has the showy comedic performance but sandler has a lot of good reaction lines to the craziness around him like yeah. whatever like the whipping eggs and he says now why did i do that and dave's response without like he, i don't even think he blinks or moves he just <laughs> says because i refused to spoon with you last night <laughs> And it's like, an, and I love that Buddy has to keep calling him out because when Dave has those moments, they're so passive aggressive. <laughs> I think my favorite scene of that happening is in Kurt Fuller's office. Yeah. When, when Buddy keeps calling him Fran. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. that stuff that you can't even explain. Like when, <laughs> when he says it's Frank and Buddy just goes, oh, Fran. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why did he think he heard that? <laughs> and then every time, like, Dave goes to make an excuse, and he just comes in with, like, just making up sounds. <laughs> and then at the end of it, he just goes, Fran? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, because this is a case where, as seemingly far-fetched as the twist is, it leaves you questioning if everything is the test. Like, was Fran part of the test? Did he know Dave was going to snap if he kept saying Fran instead of Frank? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, almost, there's almost a joy in the way he says, oh, Fran. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's all his interactions with Alan Cover. <laughs> but then there's like you were talking about though the interesting thing about this is Sandler has more than one adversary here when it comes to people that could potentially take the show away from him and that, that's the thing too is Sandler's willingness to do that needs to be commended as well mm -hmm. it was like it could definitely have just been like you look at it and you think it's the Sandler and Jack show. And it's like, what an amazing team up. Let's see how much comedy we can get out of these two colliding. And it's like, that's not even to advertise what Tartaro's doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I do wish, before we go into the Toro, because he's a gold mine, I do kind of wish another person that won an Oscar for a comedic performance was Marissa Tomei. Mm-hmm. So I kind of wish that she had gotten more to do than just the girlfriend. I feel like she could have been, they could have really done something with her character. Well, I mean, she was the mastermind. Yeah. But like when you, when you look at like the performance of my cousin, Benny, you're like, there's a lot she can do. It's, and especially comedically. And it's like, if they had made her character a bit more outside the box of the girlfriend character, I feel like, it would have made her casting more worthwhile. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but she just kind of has to be the, the girlfriend character. So that that kind of sucks, especially when you know you have somebody that's capable of comedy. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, I don't have a suggestion off the top of my head of how they could have done that. While still making her the character that does the things that she does. Yeah. And is likable. Yeah. And it's, I, I guess the main thing she has to do is seem to, seem to be a little too charmed by Buddy. <laughs> yeah. Because she's when he comes down the elevator when they're getting ready to go see his mom, she is, like, way too intrigued. Like, <laughs> you, can, you can see Dave getting nervous about it immediately. <laughs> yeah. Like, before, they've even, before he even says anything, she's like, oh, my God, is that him? <laughs> <laughs> So that's that's an, that's another case where one of those where Dave's little passive aggressive lines come in like Buddy comes down and he sees he sees her for the first time and he just hands Dave his suitcase. You just hear Dave off screen say, oh, yeah, fine, I'll take this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's the, the great thing, too, is how Sandler is so well known for how like outwardly angry his characters are. Mm -hmm. but that he does do like reserved and passive aggressive so well also like equally well yeah but um what are your thoughts on Totoro (laughs) because this would have been because obviously Totoro was mainly known for like Coen Brothers movies of course (laughs) yeah um giving one of the best betrayals of a writer ever in Barton Fink Mm -hmm. um being award worthy in Miller's Crossing and I then, just re I just rewatched Old Brother Where Art Thou the other day. He's great in that. So, and 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 all, all the Spike Lee movies he's been in, which is a ton. You're going to talk about him in your King series. Yep, we are actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, take all that in. This was oh, how can we not mention that he's in my favorite movie of all time? And oh, he's yeah, all there too. <laughs> Totoro, he he does so well with small parts. Like he yeah. knows how to get in there and make an impact and get out. Yeah, and throw a quiz show in there also. Mm-hmm. But that, that's the thing is the people we've mentioned is what's interesting. So interesting about Totoro, and you can say the same thing about Buscemi, mm-hmm. is the way he can go from one crowd to another, and he has like a whole array of greatness within filmmakers. He's got a whole line of greatness with the Coen brothers, a whole line of greatness with Spike Lee, and a whole line of greatness with Sam. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, because the year before this was Mr. Deeds, which yeah. I, I think was his first outing with Sam. I believe so. And I love the idea of, I love the way Sandler can get people like him and Buscemi to do parts like this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, cause you see like, like when you see him in Mr. Deeds, it's like, well, that's pretty random cause he's a really well-respected actor and it's like, oh, he's playing this eccentric character. And then the next, the next thing after, oh, this eccentric butler is fucking Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> and Which the way, the way that Chuck is angry, it wouldn't surprise you if Chuck stepped out of a Coen Brothers or Spike Lee movie. Yeah. Oh, he's definitely a Spike Lee character. <laughs> <laughs> with his yeah. uh, with his Grenada flashbacks. Because <laughs> he's just as angry and do the right thing for other reasons. <laughs> 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 and and how and, funny how funny is it that Sandler scored Torturo and Buscemi from the Coens? Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> did did Buscemi and Torturo ever do a Coen Brothers movie together? Lebowski. Besides that. <laughs> it's like your favorite movie. What are you talking <laughs> about? Um, they're both in Miller's Cross. Oh, okay. They're both, they're both in Barton Fink. Remember, Buscemi's the, the elf boy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so most of, their, most of their Coen Brothers movies. Okay. <laughs> I, I should have known the big Lebowski. I didn't know the other. I'd forgotten Barton Fink because it's so small. And I've never seen Miller's Crossing. Yeah, but somebody's got a really, really tiny part in Miller's Crossing that he's in there. Mm. Um, so, 
that's another thing too is i think the great thing about because it could have been a one note joke the anger management session where Totoro's there and jonathan lawbron's there and louis guzman's there and january jones is there Mm -hmm. and it could have just been the joke uh bob knight was almost there (laughs) john mackner's there later with no lines (laughs) which is so funny because he he's responsible for what you and I feel one of the funniest jokes in Mr. Deeds is. I do think Mac- McEnroe jumping the car in Mr. Deeds is the funniest scene in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I like that movie, just so we're clear. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that could have been a one-note joke of just them like doing their thing and then exploding. Mm-hmm. But like we were talking about with Buddy, Chuck's unpredictability like when, like when they're at the bar and he says he thinks he heard Harry Dean Stanton say something anti-Semitic under his breath. Mm-hmm. And Dave says, are you Jewish? And he says, I could be, but no. <laughs> 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 and then he fucks his fractions up by saying half Irish, half Italian, half Mexican. <laughs> Remember, that all starts with him saying he looked at me funny and Dave's like, I think he's blind. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, a, that's another great Dave reaction. It's the first time Chuck blows up. When he says, you're a woman beater. And he says, I don't know what all that is. But <laughs> <laughs> and then is uh, just... It's all, it, going back to Kurt Fuller's office, that's another one, too. It's connected to the Chuck scene when, when he's like, he... When um, Buddy is telling Frank what happened on the plane. And he's like, he broke her nose. And Dave's response is just, I broke the cocktail waitress's nose. <laughs> <laughs> that's really I love that that kind of writing like that's really great comedic writing right there mm-hmm. and there's a line in What About Bob that's one of the best lines in the kind of gets me the same line but we'll get to that mm-hmm. um, where it's like the way the jokes the different jokes add up to something when it's mm-hmm. just this one unexpected payoff like that <laughs> like you like it, it occurs to you it's like oh they must have messed the continuity up because it was the other one but the way the way Dave makes his situation first by adding in, oh, by the way, the cocktail wait just happened too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's the, um, what was I going to do? Oh, um, there's just the way that Torturo can just slip lines in without making them a big deal. Mm-hmm. Like when he says, um, I went from happy to angry, skip sad, now I feel like kicking his ass. Mm-hmm. Like it's gonna be this big thing that Chuck wants to fight him, and he's doing this whole thing. He's like really going ham. Mm-hmm. It's like it's just the line just happens to sneak in there. You think you're better than me because you don't know you're not. <laughs> 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 it's like it just sneaks in. <laughs> Let's not forget when uh, when he shows up at Dave's intercom and goes through his spiel of why his job, why his day is going bad. What's funny is a lot of people single out no more fudgicals being the funny line there. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I'm already, no more fudgicals is funny, but I'm already doubled over in pain laughing at a guy like Chuck, played by Tortoro, saying the line, I'm in a bad mood. I was fired from my ice cream truck job. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, so that's what he did. I seriously feel like Chuck has to be some sort of relative of his character and do the right thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're both in food service. <laughs> and they're both extremely angry about it. <laughs> Did we ever get a last name for Chuck? If he has one, it's probably on Wikipedia. Wikipedia usually does first and last names more than IMDb does. Oh. But, um... <laughs> I was going to say, it might match. And also, sometimes he doesn't even need a line. Something I didn't notice for a long time was um, when Buddy says the line, your temper's the one thing you can't get rid of by losing it. Mm-hmm. We get, like, a, a shot of the group, and you can see Tartar off to the side, like, figuring that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, when you can just do background stuff like that, um, it's really, like, valuable to a comedy. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know a character you're probably because we kind of got this transition with Harry Dean Stanton in here. Mm-hmm. 
which I remember correctly was uh, Jack bringing him along because they were like best friends. Yeah. Which is great. Because it's, <laughs> it's such a perfect, really tiny role. <laughs> <laughs> I know a char- I know for a fact a character you love that's not a very big role in this is Kevin Nealon as the lawyer. <laughs> I just love <laughs> Kevin Nealon. The worst lawyer of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Like whenever she sentences him to prison and he's just like, isn't that a little harsh? No. Okay. <laughs> it almost seems like it would have to be an ironic joke in itself that the person playing Dave's boyfriend is the person that won an Oscar for my cousin Benny. The person that like made the whole case come together in that movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. <clears throat> and he's stuck with Kevin Neal. <laughs> <laughs> and just, this is one of those cases where it's like the thing I always talk about with Norm Macdonald and Billy Madison. Does Kevin Nealon have any lines in this that aren't funny? Like, even when he's doing exposition, it's in a funny way. Like, I mm-hmm. love the, um, when Buddy comes in and goes up to the judge, and it's like, is this bad? And it's like, well, it's bad that he's talking to her, but it's good. Nope, it's bad. It's all bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that just that that's another thing too. This movie seems to be really great about taking what would seem like just one joke ideas, yet they're funny every time we see them. Mm-hmm. It's like there's a, there's always something new and funny that Kevin Nealon does that's just a total and complete fuck up. Mm-hmm. That's not even to mention throwing the tennis ball at Harry Dean Stanton. <laughs> Kevin Nealon always makes those little roles count, too. Like the golfer in Happy Gilmore. Gary Potter. (laughs) Yeah. Mr. Mr. Cheezle and Grandma's Boy. (laughs) (laughs) There's a lot of funny little roles going on in here. Woody Harrelson. I remember the very first thing I ever heard about this movie, like the first time I ever heard about this movie's existence was there was a set picture that came out that was in like a mag, it was in like People or something. Mm-hmm. And it was a picture of Woody Harrelson in drag. Mm-hmm. And it was like, first off, it, it, you wouldn't have suspected how small the part is. Mm-hmm. And secondly, it is like, because it's such a small part, how unexpected that is. Like this movie, this like I said, this is another thing this movie's full of is just casting choices like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the way, because Sandler can pull, Sandler can seemingly pull just about anybody. <laughs> he seems to be friends with just about everyone. <laughs> and it's like I'm curious about the the pitch to Woody Harrelson about this because I feel like with Woody Harrelson it could have gone one of two ways. Mm-hmm. Either you had to really, really convince him or he was game at the very first second he heard the idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't know enough about Woody Harrelson to know which it would have taken. <laughs> but I feel like given Harrelson's performance in the movie, he was probably game from the get-go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if most of his was improvised. Yeah, because it's so... I'm going to use this term a lot when we talk about... Uh, what about Bob? Mm-hmm. The scene with Woody Harrelson in the car feels so chaotic in the mm-hmm. little, in the little time frame it was. <laughs> and that, no- that, it's funny that you bring that up, how chaotic it is, because at the end, whenever they're celebrating their graduation, Buddy tells me, said, I never doubted you for a second, except for when Galaxia had a hold of you. <laughs> And then, of course, the ultimate payoff that they run into each other and he's out of drag. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody else in that scene when uh, we see Gary, the security guard. Mm-hmm. I, just, I just love his response whenever Dave in the middle of this big crowd is just like, Galaxia? And he's like, it's Gary. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, how... Have we ever really appreciated how great it is that he recognizes him? Yeah. <laughs> it was like, we know because we know Woody Harrelson. 
but it's interesting that Dave knew immediately. Yeah. Because when he, at the end of the first scene, when he says, you guys are freaks, mm -hmm. that's not his Woody Harrelson voice. No. <laughs> it's almost, it's almost, the way they do that with his voice, it's almost like that was meant to be the end of it, and they decided to bring him back at the end. Yeah. <laughs> And then there's um, there's a whole bunch of scenes in this movie that feel like because I feel like you don't have this much with I hate to be that person that's like they don't make comedies like this now, mm -hmm. but I remember when we were going to the theater because you were working there by this point, mm -hmm. going to the theater around this time and seeing comedies, and it's almost like you could easily identify what were going to be instant classic scenes. Mm -hmm. Like, the scene where they share a bed feel, feels like it was just an instant classic. Mm hmm And it's like... Especially it's with how we cut to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the reveal of a, a similar thing to Richard Dreyfuss's character in The Goodbye Girl. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the main punchlines is, I like to sleep in the mood. Mm hmm And it's like, in any other movie, that would be the final punchline. Like, when he would th he'd throw out his underwear, we'd get the reaction shot of Dave, and then it would just cut. Mm -hmm. And I love that it, and that's the thing too, is usually you would say, don't drag a joke out too long. Like, usually that kind of brevity would be wanted, because you don't want to drag the joke out. Mm -hmm. But with Jack playing this character, pretty much anything he's going to do, we want to see more of. Like, we want to see more of this joke. So when he starts doing his little bedtime ritual, <laughs> it, just, it just gets funnier and funnier. <laughs> and then it turns out, did you hear that frog is the punchline they go out on. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, that joke would just be like a normal bar joke, but that it... Which is, it, which is enough of a funny joke that it breaks Sandler. Yeah, like it the causes fact that Sandler to go Jimmy Fallon on the bit. Yeah. <laughs> and I like and I think that's the thing too is I feel like another movie would just have ended it on the sound effect mm -hmm. but the thing that pushes it over is did you hear that frog and the way the way that he says it <laughs> not just that but like he looks for it he looks for the frog <laughs> to tell the joke <laughs> and the fact that this appears to be improvised Mm -hmm. Like I said, with improvisation, you can never quite confirm it for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, but the, like I said, the, if it feels improvised, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then there's another scene that felt like a, an instant classic. And that was when they, um, when Buddy stops him on the bridge. Yeah. Another scene you might be able to consider chaotic in its own. First off, it's really funny that I saw this movie before I saw West Side Story. Mm -hmm. and the first time I saw West Side Story was in school. And a lot of people had seen this by the time we watched West Side Story in school. So when the song number came in West Side Story, there were giggles in the class because we were thinking about Jack and Sam. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know what one of your favorite moments in, in this scene is... Oh, the dude that just drives by and yells, burn in hell. <laughs> I've heard you quote that so many times in that voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We cannot leave the discussion of people in small parts without bringing somebody up that I know is going to send you into a fit. John C. Riley. Yeah, let's talk about... <laughs> Let's talk about the Pana come on on a scene. <laughs> okay, so before we even say anything at all, me and you came to a discovery. Mm -hmm. We were talking, and it was like, you know, John C. Riley had been in Paul Thomas Anderson movies and some crime movies. About, like, he's in The River Wild, he's in State of Grace, uh, he was in Casualties of War, all these really serious movies and these serious roles. He's another one that can go from dramatic to serious with no problem. Or, I mean, dramatic yeah. to comedy with no problem. He was very, very, very fresh off his Oscar nomination for Chicago when he played mm -hmm. Monica. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in his, in his Mr. Cellophane scene in Chicago, 
is one of the best moments by in an Oscar nominated performance. And we were doing the math and we were adding it up because we were trying to figure out when exactly it was John C. Riley made this transition. Mm-hmm. We couldn't quite pinpoint it off the top of our heads because it was like, not only was he nominated for Chicago, he was in three of the five picture nominees that year. Gangs of New York, Chicago, and Goodfellas. Or Goodfellas, what the fuck? Scorsese's still in my head. Um, mm-hmm. The Hours. So... The dude had a bang in 2002, is what you're saying. And this went right into Panica Monica. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about Talladega Nights. And, was this in the Talladega Nights video? We talked about this. It might have been. Maybe. Yeah, Talladega Nights, Step Brothers, just all those Will Ferrell movies. <laughs> and others. Mm-hmm. We were trying to pinpoint where his transition into comedy was. And we came to the conclusion... Was this the start of it? No, I mean, it's possible. Was this the first one? <laughs> Maybe. And, and, it's, and the crazy thing is that it's a cameo. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's, it's like, we talk about Sandler having a pull on who he's pulling in. It's like, and that's the thing, too, is there's the famous viral video online when um, Jack and Daniel Day-Lewis tied at the Critics' Choice Awards for About Schmidt and Gangs in New York. Mm-hmm. And Robin Williams for one hour photo was the only other nominee. Mm-hmm. So Dan Day Lewis went and gave his speech, and then Jack had Robin Williams come up and do his speech to make it funny. Mm-hmm. And somewhere in here, Jack tries to squeeze his actual speech in, and he like just randomly calls out John C. Riley in the crowd like they're buddies. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? A, what's the connection there? And it's like at that moment in time, they would have just worked on this, mm-hmm. <laughs> like. The connections that this role that John C. Reilly has made, like being basically his ascent into his second career in comedy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's still going back and forth to those dramatic roles. But here in particular, it's so... I want to go back to 2003 with the knowledge that I have now. I want to go back to 2003 and have seen... Boogie Nights and Magnolia and his lineup in 2002 just for the what the fuck nature of him showing up. <laughs> just want to come on and watch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like I said, one of my favorite lines in this scene just goes overlooked because it just seems like exposition. Mm-hmm. I mean, really think about it. It's a hilarious line. Think about the name and the fact that he is in this whole Buddhist environment now. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but it gets me every single time the contrast of names and knowing his nature when he was a child and mm-hmm. how the name weirdly fits it. I laugh every single time I hear the line, my name is Panakamana, but yes, I was once known as Arnie Shank. <laughs> 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 the difference in names kills me every time. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! And then, of course, just the way this scene progresses—he he goes into it, le- it leads to another passive aggressive Dave comment. <laughs> What's when he says his name's Panamanapia. <laughs> and then he goes back to classic Sandler. He gets. Pana Kamanana gets Bobby Boucher tackle. <laughs> yeah. And I love how I love how his last line of the movie, with all these insults that have been hurled, is just for him to yell, You suck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's enough to get him knocked out. <laughs> oh God. But man, oh man, I wish I had really known who John C. Riley was in 2003 because that would have been the weirdest reveal. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, now it's just so commonplace post his Will Ferrell career mm-hmm. that you don't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, there's another person, speaking of Paul Thomas Anderson and Boogie Nights, mm-hmm. that just randomly materializes into this movie. But I've got a criticism here, and I wonder if you agree with it. Hmm. 
do you feel like there, obviously, once again, it's all part of the test and everything, but do you feel like the Heather Graham storyline is a really, it's a, it feels like a detour, and it goes for a long time. Like, it's a big, it feels like it's a big portion of the middle, the whole Heather Graham sequence. Mm-hmm. And for it to, but the, and the weird thing about that also is how much the, <clears throat> The twist is kind of foreshadowed because the reveal is pretty immediate that the Heather Graham thing was a test. Mm -hmm. So does that whole Heather Graham detour feel kind of pointless for how long it is? (laughs) I mean, it's I mean, it's a decent payoff comedic. Mm -hmm. That she turns out to be a psycho that likes to stuff brownies in her face. Mm. But that's a lot of build up for that payoff. Is that how do you feel about the Heather Graham thing? <laughs> the whole the whole bit? I don't know. I think it has to go on long enough for Buddy to be able to sell that he talked to his girlfriend and all that. Yeah. That's another great Dave moment. The uh, that nod that he does in the restaurant lives in in gift form forever. Yeah, that that and him giving Alan over the finger are both gifts I've used multiple times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I actually used the finger gift recently. <laughs> Buddy Rydell is quite the gift factory. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, and I know like another one of the classic scenes in the movie is the. Um, exploding in my pants monologue mm-hmm. um and like that's that's almost a payoff in itself that's where the f-bombs dropped yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's a nice I, so it is nice that there's more than one pay, that's how long this sequence is there's more than one payoff to it because mm-hmm. there's the shock factor of that that works <laughs> and then there's the payoff of the way that she is and then there's the payoff that it was all an act Mm-hmm. This is a lot happening for one sequence. <laughs> Let's not forget that the reason we're even in this sequence is because Dave played a trick and Buddy had the funniest, hammiest little breakdown ever. I, I wanted to mention that. <laughs> you wanted to mention his breakdown? I forgot to mention that we were talking about just the great things Jack did in this. Mm-hmm. So, of, co- of course, there's the obvious funny, the no more clam chowder and stuff like that. Not to mention that he starts the scene by electrocuting his hair while brushing his teeth. Yeah. <laughs> while singing, um, what is that? Is that the Fairy Godmother song from Cinderella, I think? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that really gets me in this scene is... Um, there's a comedic way of doing things that you and I have discussed. I don't know if we did it like like on video, but um, we've discussed before where it's saying the same line exactly the same way. And our main example is in Back to the Future mm-hmm. when um, Doc says, a bolt of lightning, and Marty says, what? And he says, a bolt of lightning exactly the same way he just did. Mm-hmm. Jack does that here. When he says, um, your mom's having surgery, and he's like, oh, I've got to get up to us. And then he says, it's probably pretty serious. And then the full meltdown happens. And then mm-hmm. he says, you know, well, actually, I was just kidding. It's, it's actually not that serious. And then it's the exact same delivery of, well, I better, I better get up to boss. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's the same exact line and delivery with that full meltdown in between them. (laughs) (laughs) So that's, uh, so Frank was ready to ship up the boss again. Mm -hmm. So, um, let me, let me just say too, speaking of the Boston scene, um, after Dave snaps at him for wh- what he could have said, I've been looking for an excuse to use, or for a reason to use the excuse. I had bad guacamole and I couldn't stop shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think what's, what's best about that is the 
escalation of that list. I was mm-hmm. at the bank. I was at the store. I ate bag guacamole and construction. <laughs> <laughs> and then just capping it off with any of those would have been fine. <laughs> and what's, what's great about him? I don't, so- I don't know how they would have sold the bank at like, I'm guessing is around like midnight. Yeah, I was going to say, how late was it supposed to be? <laughs> I, love, I love that I was at the bank as the first one. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> mm-hmm. And what would he need at the store that late, too, come to think of it? <laughs> Something for the bad guacamole, probably. <laughs> um, and then there's the whole escalation of. Uh, when it turns out that Marissa Tomei might be leaving him for Buddy. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Buddy becomes a, like, when it, by the time it gets to the proposal buildup, we're under the impression that Buddy is a full-on antagonist at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, you go back to your mindset the first time you saw this movie, and it's like, how is this going to go? Because Buddy's, Buddy gets really villain looking. <laughs> <laughs> he even fakes the neck brace <laughs> he's already kind of sinister looking the very first time to see him that's I, I assume we're supposed to we're supposed to assume that's him sitting in the uh, terminal at the airport at the very beginning yeah he's observing them when he says that person's watching him mm-hmm. <laughs> he's just lurking in the shadow <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because it because it sets up Dave's fear of like public intimacy, but at the same time, it's like that would have been weird if that wasn't the character we saw again. Yeah, it would have been creepy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, talking about the climax, how do you feel about the climax? Do you think it's? Do you think? I mean, obviously, comedies have this way of trying to go as big as possible in their climaxes when it may not always be necessary. Mm-hmm. There's like the whole thing where he's being chased by security, but he might be a villain. It's very dramatic if you don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like way over the top. Not to mention there's somebody that we know in this movie, like personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, the extra that you can see clear as fucking day behind Woody Harrelson when he mm-hmm. runs, or no, when he's walking, when he's running away from uh, Woody Harrelson to go back out onto the field. Yeah. There is somebody you used to work with. Owen did too. Yeah, and then after his movie theater life, he was the clerk at Blockbuster, so I saw him a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, he was in the act. he's, I'm sure still is, in the actor's guild. I think so, yeah. And he was an extra in this movie. Mm-hmm. And everybody at the movie theater was talking about it. And it was like, man, it'd be great to be able to point him out. But there's no way we'd see him. It's a full crowd shot in the stadium. There's no way we'll see him. Mm-hmm. And the very first time I saw the movie, he is plain as day. There's like a very clear shot of him. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the way the camera shot is, it's like the shot is like half Sandler, half the crowd, and you can just see him dead center. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like I notice him every time. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, that's that's why I was confused for a second. It's like it's a shot of Woody Harrelson. Oh no, it's Sandler running away because I'm not even looking at Sandler in that scene. It's like there he is. <laughs> <laughs> Do so your do your eyes do the dotted line thing from Skull Monkeys when he looks at the potato? Yeah. <laughs> There's Shout gonna, out to anybody that understand uh, understood that reference. I was gonna say after this video has been online for ten years, some random person's gonna come across it and go, "Did that person just reference Skull Monkeys?" <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, um, person that, 10 years from now, we loved Skull Monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we talked about the twist, like, first thing. Mm-hmm. So, is that about it? I think so. We've been talking about this movie yeah. for almost an hour by itself. We get one more Chuck payoff. <laughs> oh, when he jumps out of the tree? <laughs> and I love how there's no build-up to him getting up there. Mm-hmm. 
It's just he's on the ground, he's doing his thing, and then he's just in the tree. And I love this. If you watch it, if you look at it and you haven't seen the movie, you might think this is more significant than it is. Hmm. When you look at the DVD case for anger management, there are pictures on the back. Mm -hmm. There is Sandler and Jack, and Jack's doing the electrocuting his hair thing. There's a picture of Sandler and Mercer Tomei at the stadium. There's a picture of Jack doing his shrug thing after the Heather Graham line works. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of Chuck in the tree. <laughs> 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 what's interesting is this shot doesn't happen the only time we actually see chuck in the tree he's screaming as he's jumping <laughs> oh man and that, that's another thing i actually wanted to mention real quick in regards to how a, how a joke works and they do the thing that you think wouldn't work but it actually kind of does Mm -hmm. It's another Dave reaction. Is um, when he's talking about the war and what he saw, and Sandler said, uh, "Oh, Vietnam," and he said, "Grenada." And it's like in another movie, I would say the joke should stop there. There should be no elaboration on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's like only the people that know their history that will be like the funniest joke ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. But there is something about the way Dave just kind of says wasn't that like 12 hours long and chuck doesn't even acknowledge that <laughs> <laughs> it's like i think actually adds another like okay i forgive them for letting the joke go a little longer because <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny necessarily that dave explains it it's that chuck just decides to not acknowledge that because <laughs> <laughs> that's when he does the, the harry dean sand thing comes in he like interrupts it with hey that guy just looked at me yeah, because it would have been very predictable for them to kind of get an argument over it, but Chuck's just ready to move on to something else. <laughs> so, like, now the question he, He's is, moving on to a funnier joke. <laughs> <laughs> so now, it actually begs the question, did Chuck actually think he looked at him funny, or was that him running away from the confrontation of Grenada was only 12 hours long? <laughs> it's pretty then, funny to think that his way of running away from that ended in a bar fight because <laughs> yeah, it's because it's always funny when it cuts back to the judge to show us that dave is, is back in court <laughs> yeah we get that shot again later after he tackles buddy it's it's such a great callback that he that late into the movie it, it comes back <laughs> yeah because <laughs> it's like you think like the scene can't possibly end at him just tackling buddy into a chair <laughs> mm -hmm. and then just that cut tells us everything <laughs> <laughs> oh so yes um a lot of people like to hate on sandler these days for his comedies because yes um a lot of them lately are absolute shit and lazy and almost entirely devoid of laughs I would say this but, and Fifty First Dates were kind of the tail end of, like, movies that were liked by people. Yeah, I guess. I mean, he's still got a fan base that will defend even his shitty movies. But as far as, like, a universal mm -hmm. sort of audience, obviously, the, the critics kind of only always went after him. But the critics didn't even like Billy Madison. You know, yeah. That's the fact that. I paused on Happy Gilmore because I can't quite remember what its reception was, but um, but yeah, uh, that's yeah, it does almost feel like Anger Mantle was kind of uh, the beginning of the consistent the consistency of his movies becoming instant classics. Mm -hmm. So yes, but but thank God we have it, and we didn't mention yet that it's directed by Peter Siegel, who gave us Tommy Boy. So yeah, it makes sense. And they tried to make a spinoff series with Charlie Sheen that I never watched. I don't even know if, what, if it's the same thing. Yeah, I, I never knew. I feel, I think the font of like the logo is the same. So I'm guessing it's supposed to be related, but I mm -hmm. never, cared, I never cared to find out. <laughs> yeah. Nothing against Charlie Sheen. It just didn't seem very interesting. We can say against Charlie Sheen. <laughs> <laughs> No one, no one will fight us. Charlie Sheen will. 
Okay, so. Time to move on to your Christmas. <laughs> I feel like whatever, I feel like now that we're talking about what about Bob, you're like the dude in the dark night with the phone in his stomach, and you're like, it's like Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to quote Hansel and Sue Lander. Okay. Well, you go first. <laughs> what? What are your general thoughts on what about Bob? Chaotic is a good word for it. <laughs> Do you remember the absolute devastation? Because not only would it just have been great, but it would have fit. Like, it would have been appropriate because of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the all-out tragedy when we, as a family, rented a beach house in 2015? Yeah. And it was a really nice place. Mm -hmm. Like I've been, I've been longing to go back there since we left, and that was over five years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and you were exploring, and there was a cabinet under the TV, and you're like, what's in here? And there was a DVD case of What About Bob? <laughs> it was like, how perfect. A movie about a vacation while you're on vacation, and it just happens to be What About Bob? One of the greatest comedies of all time. And it was a little too great because apparently a heist had happened because the case was empty. Mine, of course. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, the case was empty. And it was like, wow, that's the most elated and let down in the span of five seconds I've ever felt. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, God, I should have brought my own copy because if I had known, I would have. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, What About Bob to me is one of the greatest comedies of all time. So, please, please continue. I had, to, <laughs> I, had to, I had to squeeze that anecdote in before I forgot about it. <laughs> nah, take it and run with it. It's your baby. Oh, uh, Well, I wanted you to go first because once I get started, I won't be able to stop. Oh, okay. <laughs> Considering it took an hour alone to talk about anger management. Yeah. Well, actually, well, let's, let's, let's save, with anger management, we started with Jack. Let's save Richard Dreyfus for a minute. That's exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's start with Bill Murray. Because Bill Murray, honestly, Bill Murray isn't doing anything all that different. He's just doing something that he's already great at. Well, at the same time, maybe it is different because usually he's known for, like, snarky characters. That's true. The guys who are like, they're funny because of how much of a douchebag they are. That's true. Ghostbusters, Groundhog Day, yeah, Scrooged. Yeah, Word. you're right. <laughs> huh? Definitely Scrooged. Yeah. So this actually does almost feel like a change of face, but I, I'm guessing you mean just like as far as being full-on comedic. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. I don't mean that he that he doesn't play it differently. I'm just saying that he's funny, but we know coming in he's going to be. Yeah, but even then, though, for being as way too friendly as Bob is, mm -hmm. he still does some pretty alarming things to get to, like, one of us lucky. Like, there is, like, like, I love towards the end when Leo brands him a brilliant sociopath. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's like, who's to say he's not? <laughs> that that I think that's another thing that works in this movie's favor is the entire movie like you want to think that Leo Marvin is a dick and he is but he's also 100% correct <laughs> in not wanting to pursue this <laughs> is that is that what makes it funnier <laughs> is that is that the secret weapon <laughs> for me when I watched it the other day it was because <laughs> I was like the sa the funny thing about this is all of this happened to him because no one listened when he was correct the entire time yeah the fact that his anger gets so over the top and it started off as justified mm -hmm. 
and obviously it goes without saying the whole backstory of he and Richard Dreyfus actually hated each other. And both, and what's funny about that is even though that's the case and they both kind of thought it was a miserable experience working with the other, mm -hmm. both of them have gone on to praise this movie and say they think the movie's hilarious and they love that their hatred for each other worked in the movie's favor. Mm -hmm. So I love that they can both not talk. I almost feel like Drives would be the type to almost like almost disown it, but he was mm -hmm. just, he just did a fan thing just a couple of years ago and praised the movie. Hmm. It's like thank God. <laughs> from what I understand too, from what I've heard, like that's that's a couple pretty big egos too. Yeah, I think Murray's yeah. I think Murray's kind of mellowed out in his old age, but I don't know about Dreyfus. Yeah, I feel like Dry like you hear stories about Dreyfus, but I also I when I see him now, I kind of get the sense that he's a bit more mellow. Mm -hmm. But um, the thing also was um, Dreyfus mentioned that at that panel thing a couple years ago, and then there was also a thing recently, relatively recently, where um, Murray was on Ellen, mm -hmm. and Ellen asked him if he ever rewatches his movies, and mm -hmm. Mur Bill Murray loves to watch his. Like he will get like when they come out, he will go to the theater and just watch them. Now I want a life experience where I watch a Bill Murray movie with Bill Murray. Yeah, and when Ellen asked him if there's any particular movies of his he likes to rewatch, this was the first one he named. And I'm sure that made your heart sore. And I love the fact that not only do Murray and Dreyfus both acknowledge it was a miserable experience making it, but I like the way the movie turned out. They seem to love the movie. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. <laughs> and obviously, obviously for good reason. <laughs> so, I, like, apparently it got to the point to where I guess Murray was drunk on set sometimes. And, like, like he actually threw an ashtray at Dreyfus once. Good lord. And, like, he, like, really blew up at him and said, nobody likes you. They, I think he said, nobody likes you, they tolerate you, is what he said to Richard Dreyfus. But like I said, I've heard Richard Dreyfus has his own, like, like it didn't come out of nowhere that Murray said that. Yeah. Um, but like I said, it seems like they both mellowed out in old age. And like I said, it, the fact that they can both appreciate the movie, I think, says a lot about the movie's quality. <laughs> says a lot, too, about Frank Oz being able to get that movie made despite all of that chaos. Yeah. So like I said, Frank Oz has got to be one of the most underappreciated names when it comes to directing. Obviously, he's a massive name because of, you know he's Miss Piggy, he's Yoda. We just talked about him not too long ago. <laughs> yeah, Bowfinger. Yeah, Bowfinger, Bowfinger, Dirty Run Scoundrels, and What About Bob are like the holy trifecta to me. Uh, <laughs> Frank Oz, as a comedic director, needs to be more on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, any more general thoughts? Well, I guess we're kind of more on Murray now. Yeah. Do you think the movie ever risks Bob being a little too much? Obviously, I, I think the movie's flawless, so I'm... I think that's kind of the point. I think if they didn't do that with him, then Dr. Marvin's mental breakdown wouldn't be as justified. Yeah, and it's and it's major props to Murray that Bob is always funny because mm -hmm. it's like it's props to both of them that we get the more he drives Leo insane, Leo's outbursts get funnier. Mm -hmm. But yet, while we can laugh at how annoying Bob is to Leo, he's never annoying to us, the audience. Mm -hmm. There's a really skillful balance happening here. Yeah, because we can acknowledge that, yeah, if we were in Leo's shoes, we would be annoyed, but we're the audience, so we're not. Yeah, there's like an almost supernatural level of balance mm -hmm. to this. And they do a good job of kind of helping that along by having those two people that run the diner in town hate him and paint him as a dick. And plus, when we first meet him, he is very full of himself. Like, when it, like, the little moment where he's like looking on his bookshelf for his book and there's a whole goddamn row and he's just like, oh, here it is. 
the best bit that's just a tiny little moment there is um when he gives bob a book and he's like here read this and this will help you and he sends him on his way mm-hmm. and then when he's talking to his tape recorder he's talking about you know do this acknowledge this oh and bill in 30 dollars for the book <laughs> yeah <laughs> I also, I also love the moment where it's like um, when we see him being all full of himself, and yet um, when the doctor, when Bob's old doctor calls him up and it's like transferring him to him, he says the reason I'm transferring him is because you're brilliant. Now I don't, I know you don't like flattery, and it's like we know Leo Marvin loves fucking flattery. Yeah. <laughs> Because I feel like there's even almost like a subtle look on his face to say, like, I won't tell him if you won't. But he hears that. Mm-hmm. I think another thing that makes Bob so funny to me is that I don't know if this is, I don't think this is supposed to be the case. This is just a me problem. But obviously, um, this is a little personal, but I'll throw it out there. Hmm. So there was that time a few years ago where you and your wife um, got me an appointment that I went to, Mm -hmm. and it was more or less concluded that I have a shitload of phobias. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a whole page in this guy's book, where it's like, you have this phobia, this phobia, this phobia, and this phobia, and so on. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you know me, that's not surprising to you. Mm-hmm. So even though I don't think we're supposed to think this way or go into the movie this way, there is an alarming number of things about Bob in these opening scenes that I find extremely relatable. <laughs> As I say, you guys do about the same, the same kind of job of riding an elevator. Yep. And it's, I've, I've even had that expression on my face when it's like, yeah, just take the elevator up there. Thank you. Elevator. <laughs> <laughs> that's like when me, the- that's like when me and Susan went to New York and we, we rode in the, uh, in the elevator in Rockefeller center, the roof is clear. So you could see it going up. And our very first thought was we looked at each other and we both said he would never survive this. <laughs> Then there's the there's the great moment when um, he puts on his nice clothes, he brushes his teeth, he gets ready to go. He goes up to Gil and he's like, "Bye, Gil. I gotta go to work." And he just turns in his chair and he walks home. <laughs> yeah. And then obviously um, going outside, he go he goes like really slowly. <laughs> And he's like, he's trying to talk to himself, like, yeah, everything's fine. And that, that dude runs by him, like, talking to himself angrily. And it's like, everything's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> Speaking of which, it's kind of funny in itself that uh, somebody like Bob ends up living in New York. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um, you think he would have moved. That's probably why he feels so at home at Lake Winnipesaukee. That's probably why he got attached to it. <laughs> yeah. Despite the fact that it kind of cures him in the process, ironically enough. Mm-hmm. So um, there was something else I was going to mention, and I forgot it. Um, but uh, it'll probably come back to me. But it was long after the fact. Um, so, um, it's, and the whole thing about, um, I love that this is another thing where it's like, this movie's just so well written. Like I, I cannot express that enough. How well written this movie is. Mm-hmm. So it's like the the piece of information and the diagnosis, I guess you can call it that, um, that gets Bob attached to Leo. This whole funny bit of Bob was once married, mm-hmm. even though he doesn't end the movie single. <laughs> this que- <laughs> this question begs you who the hell married Bob <laughs> but then there's the whole thing of um, not to mention that him not ending the movie single is not built up to in any way whatsoever <laughs> it's but, literally it's literally done in the space of a cut yeah. but his his explanation of like it's funny enough like He's like, you know, do you want to talk about your divorce? And he says, there are people who like Neil Diamond and those who don't. 
my wife loves it. Um, mm-hmm. And it, he doesn't even say anything. He, just, he doesn't say anything derogatory about Neil Diamond. He just alludes to the fact that they got a divorce because she liked Neil Diamond. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's like, that's funny in itself. Like, that is, a, that is a great setup for the Bob character. And then for the fact that Leo is able to twist this and say, the way he words it to help Bob figure out, oh, it was the other way around. And so it's like, this is the first time it's occurred to Bob. We didn't break up because of Neil Diamond. We didn't mm-hmm. divorce because of Neil Diamond. Mm-hmm. It's like, the, this is the turning point. Like, the, you can even see it in Bob's eyes. That is what doomed Leo. Was just coming to that very easy conclusion that Neil Diamond did not cause this divorce. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and just, like I said, just writing like that is so perfect in how it's not direct about it. Like the writing itself, as far as Leo as a doctor, like the way it comes back to um, the way Bob being able to analyze being tied up with the explosives. And the conclusion mm-hmm. he comes to, like the analogy he comes to, is like that's actually like the the joke is that it's like Bob reaching because obviously Leo just wants to kill him at this point. Mm-hmm. But that the analogy makes sense. <laughs> makes sense to the point that Bob wrote a book about it, and then Leo is suing him for the rights to the book. Uh, it's like you just don't. Which I love that because it shows that Leo hasn't grown at all. Yeah. From this experience. I heard most of, most critics like this movie. But there were some people that thought, like I think Siskel had problems with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like one of which was um, that the ending is too abrupt. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I love the ending. I just <laughs> it is very abrupt. <laughs> but I'll you give him that. that. The fact that Bob is now in his family and his his whole attitude doesn't seem to change. Like the whole thing is bringing him out of a catatonic state that Bob has put him into. <laughs> I don't know. I think the, the abruptness of it is what makes it so funny to me, but we're, we got way ahead of ourselves. So, <laughs> um, you brought up the Gutmans earlier. Mm-hmm. That's another case where there's so many lines in this movie that stick with me. I feel like I could whip out just about any quote from this movie in regular conversation. Mm-hmm. Like any any time I hear the phrase "son of a bitch," I immediately think to myself, "She never says that." <laughs> <laughs> Every time, and just their reaction. That's another one of those jokes where it's a one joke idea, but it gets funnier every time. Because it's one joke, but it almost seems to escalate whenever they see them. Goes, son of a bitch, she never says that. It's one joke. Then, then the guy being cordial is like, you know, hey, there's Dr. Marvin. But the woman just saying, burn in hell, do his thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Both, well, that Bob and anger management have great deliveries of burn in hell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they're people in cars. Mm-hmm. But then there's one more payoff that me and you, do you remember the day me and you discovered what it was she was saying in the boat? No. We had to put the subtitles on. There's the moment when um, Leo's there and the Gutmans are out in the boat and they make eye contact. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the woman shouts, Mrs. Gutman shouts something at him that we could never figure out. And we were like, what is it that she said? Because I kind of figured she was just screaming at him. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize what she was saying. And then we put the subtitles on, and me and you completely lost our shit. (laughs) Mm -hmm. For those that don't know, or those of you that have never watched What About Bob the subtitles, or just haven't been able to catch it, she is simply screaming Hitler at him. <laughs> 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 and I, what I, I think what I love about that scene is that's one of those scenes that's pure chaos. Mm-hmm. Like, Leo's world is in such turmoil in these few seconds. Because he's got Sigmund by the shirt doing the diving thing. Bob comes by in the sailboat, and the Gutmans are out in their boat. 
and when he sees Bob, he accidentally drops Sigmund into the water. Mm -hmm. And in the span of 10 seconds, everybody is yelling at him. Sigmund pops up and yells, murderer. Bob's over here going, I'm sailing. And Mrs. Gummit's going, hello. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a chaotic 10 seconds for him. <laughs> it's no wonder he snaps. <laughs> oh, and I do, I do love the way when, when Bob comes back, just the way he goes, I'm a sailor. I sail. I sail. <laughs> <laughs> It's like just just these small lines, just everything in this movie is just the funniest thing in the world to me. I feel like it's like, <laughs> I feel like I'm on something when I watch this movie because every little thing is funny to me. <laughs> and sometimes it could be the thing that came before or maybe something that I know is coming next that I'm anticipating already. But I just feel, I feel like I am laughing constantly when I watched this movie. Like, it is it is a marathon to watch this movie. I tire out from laughing watching this movie. <laughs> Not forget one of my favorite lines in its delivery is uh, during the storm when he's trying yeah, yeah. to get him to leave. There's and, there's and there's beat after beat here that I love. It's, uh, tell me the slicker line that you love so much. Well, I just love the build-up to it. Like, I love whenever uh, Julie Haggerty goes out to talk to him, and the rain is not letting up at all, and he's just like, "Shh, I think it's letting up." <laughs> he's he's desperate. Yeah. He's desperate for the rain to let up. <laughs> and the fact that he snaps when he says that he could borrow his slicker. Now, the thing I love about this mm -hmm. is, for starters, I mentioned before. You have called out that he can borrow my slicker line before. Mm -hmm. Every time I see that now, I don't necessarily just laugh at the line. I laugh at the fact that I know how much you love that line. <laughs> and that makes it funnier. I think what helps is I think it's I think it's the angriest use of the word slicker I've ever heard in my life. And there's no and he's so he's so like, oh, we can do this. He can do this. He can do this. And it just escalates immediately to, he can borrow my slicker. Yeah. And then there's two other payoffs to this that I love consecutively. Mm -hmm. I love that he follows that up with a smile with lightning hitting his face and a crack of thunder. <laughs> and then there's an immediate cut of, I love that you love the slicker line so much. Do you also love the fact that it's followed by a cut? of Bob in the slicker. Yeah. <laughs> like, we, he's in the slicker in the next cut. <laughs> so they <laughs> used that idea. <laughs> and that's the thing, too, is the whole point of this, like these videos, is to sort of analyze why we think these things are funny. Sometimes I don't know if there is an answer. With movies like this, like I said, maybe it's just the whole product. Maybe it's because I'm thinking about things that have already happened and I'm anticipating the other things that are going to happen. And just knowing that whatever's happening now is in the same world, it's just already... <laughs> like, I lo like, one of the things I love is um, the way Bob's phobias never rest in the way of when he leaves the house the first time he's walking down the empty road mm -hmm. and it's like, Oh good. You know, there's nobody here. You know, there, there's, I'm not going to be packed in. It's not going to be crazy people around me. There's not going to be hustle and bustle. There's nobody here. That's great. And then immediately it's a fear. There's nobody here. <laughs> <laughs> but then already the fears start to let up because it's, um, the closeness he gets to Leo's family. Mm hmm when it's like the first step that he makes is when he runs into Anna and he's like, does anybody else use this car? And when she says, it's just us. He's like, I don't need to protect myself. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's almost touching. <laughs> like that's another thing. When, um, when he pays Ada to throw the call, uh, the office for to call mm -hmm. Leah, um, and poses his sister when he takes the phone away and is acting like, you know, he doesn't want to touch it. And then he says, it's not you, it's me. Mm -hmm. I've had to do that before. Where it's like, you touch that, so I don't want to touch it. It's not you. It's not you. 
it's not. <laughs> You were talking about how quickly Leo can escalate. I forgot to mention one of my favorite parts about that too is watching when he knows he's gone too far and has to rein himself in, like with the slicker bit. But my absolute favorite is after he's already gone full breakdown and he's sitting by the water and it's after he's left Bob in the woods and he's like, on Monday we'll eat Gil, on Tuesday we'll eat Bob. And then he goes, no, no, that's too dark. (laughs) I I think I love that too you know there's something very funny going on here when it gets to a point where obviously he has to say Bob's name a lot. Mm -hmm. But by the time we get to the second half of this movie, every single solitary time Leo Marvin says the name Bob is the funniest thing in the world to me. I I think it starts with the alarm clock scene. Yeah. (laughs) When he's shaking him awake and says Bob 50 times, louder and louder each time, which, by the way, is a, it's, it's such a classic but great payoff that that quiet little alarm clock finally wakes him up after all that. Mm-hmm. But, like, seriously, every time, like, every time he says Bob in that scene is funnier every time and then every time after the movie. And the one that just really gets me, the one that really drives it all, is when <laughs> he leaves Bob out there with the explosives. And it's such a perfect delivery of a name. <laughs> and he's running away. And he's like, oh, be sure to feed Gil for me. He's like, yeah, I'll feed him till he's big and fat. And then I'll eat him, Bob. <laughs> 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 it's like the, the anger and the fury every time he says Bob's name. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, then you get to the point when he kicks him out of the car and he's not even using words anymore. <laughs> yeah. The, the Go Watch It, there are two YouTube videos that are just the scene of him kicking Bob out of the car. <laughs> when he says, get out of the car, it, he's, he's, I think it's clear he's saying, get out of the car. The subtitles on the DVD say, get out of there. Mm-hmm. But in reality, he's, there, are no, there aren't words. Get is in there, and then it's just <laughs> noise. It's just a sound, and it's like this escalation is what makes Drive's performance so brilliant. It is one of my favorite. It might be. I say this is my favorite comedy of all time. I think this is the funniest movie I've ever seen. I think Richard Drive's in it might also be my favorite comedic performance. And it's it's just this masterclass in escalation. Though we can't talk about this without giving credit to Frank Oz as well, because what I think I love about this movie also is we talk about the chaos. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely totally chaotic in certain places, but yet it's such a controlled chaos. It's like you were talking about that character trait with Leo when he knows he's going too far in some points, mm-hmm. and it's like I feel like Frank Oz is the same way. Where it's like there's just enough chaos without going too over the top. It only goes way over the top when it's time. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't, we don't get to the house exploding. <laughs> until the fair. But it's one of those cases where the progression has been so perfectly done. And the buildup and everything. And, you know, like Leo's insanity. And just the shit that Bob causes, like, unknowingly. It's like, you look at this movie, it's a comedy about a psychiatrist that's, you know, driven crazy by his patient. Mm -hmm. It would seem outlandish at the beginning of this movie, that at the end of the movie, a house explodes. But when we get to that point in the movie, we are barely, if at all, surprised. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because it's been such a step, it's been a baby step process to mm-hmm. get to that point. <laughs> it's, oh, my God. And, and it's we, we, like we were talking about what Jack does in anger management, the way his expressions can change. Mm-hmm. I love when Sigmund dives for the first time. And Julie Haggerty's like, oh, come on, look at this. He is so, so happy when he goes to the window. His mouth is a gate. 
he is smiling. <laughs> 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 when, he just, <laughs> when he sees that it's Bob. <laughs> and it's like I said, this, in those moments, oh, those moments when you know Bob's going to set him off. <laughs> when you know before he knows that Bob's going to set him off. <laughs> With. With the way that people, with the way that the stories are about those two working on the movie, I wonder if that's actually Richard Dreyfuss reacting to Bill Murray being out there, and knowing that they're getting ready to do a scene soon. <laughs> Just that that face drop because he is so happy. Like it'd be one thing if he was like neutral happy and then his face dropped, but he was really, really happy and then his face just went the complete opposite direction. <laughs> I just love how when he goes to the dock, he just casually pushes Bob, and of course the Gutmans see it. <laughs> That's where Hitler comes in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please, please do not take this video out of context and just have a single video of me laughing hysterically going, and That's when Hitler came in. <laughs> <laughs> do, uh, not, do not ever single that out. <laughs> oh, God. So there's, and there's so many individual scenes we haven't even touched yet. Mm -hmm. I relate to Leo so much. I didn't even realize this was a thing until I saw Leo Marvin. And I was like, that is absolutely a thing. It's so funny that you're able to relate to both characters. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> For do you me, think that's what? Do you think that's what helps your love for the movie? It's very possible because there is a moment. Because this is the great thing about this movie, also, is it is a gift to me. Because the scene I'm about to mention mm -hmm. gives me a gift of comedy in a situation that I hate being in in real life. For me, it's babies screaming in restaurants. Mm -hmm. The dinner scene when Bob is doing his mmm thing, and every new mmm makes Leo twitch more and more. I love, by the way, that when he gets to his surprise party and he sees the party, Leo is full on twitching by now. <laughs> <laughs> but that thing that's happening, where Leo cannot take a bite because Bob's doing his mmm thing. Like every time Bob does it, he pulls the chicken away and he can't do it. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that was a thing until you hear a baby screaming in a restaurant when you're trying to eat. For some reason, that's a thing. You stop yourself. <laughs> like you can't be interrupted while eating. And it's like every time I'm in that situation and it's driving me crazy, I suddenly realize that I am Leo Marvin in this moment. And I, and I start laughing. This movie is a gift in real life situation. <laughs> <laughs> so, you haven't had to had you haven't had to worry about that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's another scene. I need to ask I need to know if there's anything else about Dreyfus or anything else you have to say because there's one scene in this movie that I could write a book on. Which is This is the scene where Richard Dreyfuss's performance in this movie starts to become award-worthy. This is the scene that makes Richard, that starts off Richard Dreyfuss's performance being what I think is one of the comedic performances of all time. Mm -hmm. The centerpiece, the comedic gold mine at the center of this already vast mine of greatness is the Good Morning America scene. The Good Morning America scene is what about Bob's magnum opus? Mm. <laughs> Which works out really well because that's the moment that we've been building to the entire movie. And that's the thing, is when comedies have a scene that they really, really build up to, you have to, you have to make that worthwhile. Are you thinking of Step Brothers and the Wine Mixer? Yeah. Obviously, a lot of people will use that as an example of this is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. But I feel like a lot of comedies, really, usually it's a forced climax or a forced conflict. But this is absolutely worth the build-up. 
this scene could not have been more perfectly executed. From when they arrive to the aftermath. Mm. Like the, the moment you love, when they say, why did you kick Bob out? And he says, he's not gone. That's the point. He's never gone. And he opens the door and he's just still there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see, that is the last moment of this sequence. That's the final payoff of a sea of amazing comedic moments. Let's not forget that the that the start of this is waking him up with the with the alarm. <laughs> That's where this starts. It's really, this movie is relentless. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, we have, there's actually, let's go even farther back. <laughs> let's, let's do what the movie doesn't build up. Um, Charlie Corson, who the same year, I think, played Jack in Hook. Mm -hmm. The year before, he was the kid in Dick Tracy. He had a really good young career. Um, and then he, when he was older, he popped up in Can't Hardly Wait. Um, he's really funny in this. Because you would think the kid character would be kind of throwaway. Um, but he's got two really great moments in this scene when they get caught doing the Tourette's. Thing. First off, I love the Bob's massive fear of death, now, or the kid of uh, Sigmund's massive fear of death is something that I can relate to. That has been me since childhood and now. I will just sit in bed at night and fear death, uh, <laughs> as I'm sure most of us do sometimes. Um, and then is, just, that, is that why you don't like Pirates too? Because every time Davy Jones says, do you feel death? Your answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting reference to go into. I just, I had it on last night in the background while I was doing other shit. And then this goes into the Tourette's thing. And I love his delivery. He has two great deliveries in a row here that I love. I love when Leo bursts in and says, what is going on? Like, you would, the joke itself is funny. They're just screaming obscenities at each other. But then it's the way Leo comes bursting in, and he's like, what is going on in here? His, he has a perfect delivery of, Tourette's down. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the great moment of, um, I want some peace and quiet. I'll be quiet. I'll be peace. Mm -hmm. I feel like, and this is another case of, I'm sure it wasn't improvised or anything, but that laugh from Murray sounds really genuine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, for this kid to say a line, and Murray Murray's laugh sounds like it's genuine, I feel like that's got to be a, a, a... Imagine being a kid, and if, if, whether it's in character or not, making Bill Murray laugh like that. <laughs> yeah. I love how Faye can't resist a crack either. <laughs> hmm. And then, yes, because this is going to be so relentless, then we get the alarm clock scene. And then comes the glorious Good Morning America scene. And what I think I love about this the most is that I'm when I say this is this movie's comedic magnum opus, I am fully looking at Leo. And if you remember, Richard Dreyfus barely speaks in this. Mm -hmm. This is all... This is all reaction and expressions. <laughs> There's one key delivery. I do love when Bob's being all casual and Leo's already frazzled because Bob is here next to him for Good Morning America. This big, supposedly crowning achievement in his career. This is going to be what really makes him truly a big, big deal in his field. Mm -hmm. He's going to be famous. That's what he's talking about at the beginning. And he's had this whole rehearsed thing. He's saying it in the mirror in one scene right before um, they're doing the Tourette's thing. Mm -hmm. And he goes through this whole rehearsed speech in one long monotone way. That's not even and, a valid response to her question. Yeah. And then just that look of, oh my God, I fucked up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then from then on, Leo is just all facial expressions in this thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, well, actually, even before this, there's just little tiny moments in there that I love. Like, not only is Bob involved now, 
but there's just that little moment where he takes he t- it seems in Leo's mind he probably took full control like a dictator when he was just he was just casually being helpful like because he overheard something so it's like when the camera crew comes in and they're like uh, he's like I thought we would go by the fireplace and they're like oh it's a fireplace shot it's a fireplace shot and they all go over there mm-hmm. and then Bob is just kind of meekly by the door and that other guy comes in and he's like where are we going he's like I think it's a <laughs> it's like you just know Bob being casually helpful like that was making Leo's head explode. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the actual scene itself. Have you ever just watched this scene and only watched Leo? <laughs> yeah. And there are those moments where you can just see him cracking. Like there's there's a moment where while Bob is talking, he's just staring into the camera. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because he doesn't know what to do with himself because he's so frazzled. <laughs> and then his seat's taken and it really throws him for a loop. <laughs> I love, I fucking love when his seat's taken. Because <laughs> <laughs> Bob just like casually moves over and he just keeps talking. And Leo's mind just stops working. Like it's a, like it just he sees Bob in the chair and he just has a full on does not compute moment. <laughs> you know the guy's trying to direct him and he's like, um, <laughs> <clears throat> it's like I feel like I also feel like the one thing that would have made this scene um, even funnier than it is is if we got at least one point of view shot from the camera itself. <laughs> mm-hmm. But he, like, Leo is like half out of the frame and like half sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! And then of course um, the ap- the aftermath. Like this was Leo's breaking point. <laughs> it makes perfect sense that it's like the movie's centerpiece because it's Leo's ultimate breaking point. Mm-hmm. So he starts doing this whole thing where he's going to try to get him committed, <laughs> which comes into the whole thing of. Now we have to wonder if Leo's right and Bob is just a brilliant sociopath. Like, I, f- I mean, I feel like the opening scenes give us the idea that we see him enough in his own element that we can, mm-hmm. um, like, you know, take that out of the equation, rule that out. But um, it's... <laughs> I love that Leo essentially looks at Bob like he's this verbal Kent type character. <laughs> I really, it's like, it's almost like, the movie actually does become a thriller if you look at it from Leo's perspective. <clears throat> yeah. You could... I, wonder if I believe Leo there's does. a cut out there on YouTube of a What About Bob trailer as if it was a horror movie. I was going to say, I wonder if that's happened yet because this is right for it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it has. Like, this is, this is as right for it as the one with um, the one they did for Mrs. Doubtfire was. Yeah. <laughs> And then I love... uh, I mean, I feel like if you can make The Shining look like a lighthearted family tale, then yeah, you could do it. Yeah. Like I said, sometimes there's just shots I appreciate. Like I said, like getting things in one shot, like we were talking about the the expression with Jack, the I said over easy line. We see in one shot him go from angry to relaxed to wider than you. I love the idea. (laughs) You mean to say from happy to angry, it skips sad, and I'll just want to kick his ass? (laughs) I love the shot we get uh, when he drops Bob off at the hospital. And then I, feel like, I feel like that little run of emotions from Totoro is Leo Marvin's character in a nutshell in the second half of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only instead of kicking his ass, it's murder. <laughs> yeah. But I love that shot when he drops Bob off at the hospital. And it's just one distant shot of the house. And we see him dance up the steps, get the phone call, and run back into the car and take off. And it's just all one shot from the distance. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like that, stuff like that was a brilliant goal. Uh, And then, like, I was talking about, um, there was a line similar, like, the the callback, the unexpected callbacks. Or not even just necessarily callbacks, but, like, knowledge that we have in the movie's universe can just suddenly make something the joke, an in-universe joke can just suddenly be hilarious unexpectedly um, like the whole um, 
because you broke a cocktail waitress, or you broke a flight attendant's note, and they said, no, I broke the cocktail waitress's note. And it's like, because we know this, and it was just in the back of our heads, it just snuck up on it. It was a great punchline to this. And it's like, how brilliant of a moment is Because we almost forget, we almost forget along with everybody else, how brilliant of a moment is it in the writing of this movie? And like, to the point that it's gotten so chaotic, we forget enough that this is so funny to us because it sneaks up on us. When he's talking to the doctor and he's just letting everything out, it's like, you do not understand that this guy is insane. He is a sociopath. He is a psycho. He is all of the above. He is everything. And he's losing his mind. And the doctor says, just calm down. You need to take a vacation. And he's like, I'm on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, it's, it's like you, you forget just enough that when he says it that way, you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's, well, it's so brilliant. I just love this. And then I just, I just, yeah, I can't. I said, it's even hard to analyze. It just, it all speaks for itself. It is just, like I said, relentlessly funny. Mm-hmm. in a way that so few comedies can be. There are quite a few classic comedies that definitely can pull off relentless moment after moment after moment for an entire movie and never miss a beat and never have a joke that falls flat or a moment that falls flat. And we even get stuff that's so... There are scenes that are so funny, we forget about scenes in the same scene, the moments in the same scene that are almost equally funny. Like when I talked about the get out of the car thing. Mm-hmm. He throws him out of the car. That's not to even mention how funny it is when Bob is saying, we should, you know, make appointments, you know, to, we should do like, you know, two hours a week, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And he just screams at the top of his lungs before he stops the car. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I believe Bob's response is, oh, you'd rather do mornings. <laughs> Uh, and then this, this is a point where you can almost buy that Bob is intentionally being antagonizing. Mm-hmm. Like when um, when he gets pulled over by the cop, and then Bob goes by in the truck, and he's like, can you be sure he's home by seven? And that almost seems antagonizing. But at the same time, it's like, is it just Bob being helpful and saying, don't forget, you got to be home at seven? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, and, and that's when we get to the point that um, Leo Marvin turns into Dave Buzz and just starts talking under his breath. It's like when he gets the flat tire and he's like, oh, that's just great. You get it right. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> mm-hmm. Notice, too, how it's, how it's a revert, how these movies are almost like perfect, re, like opposites of each other. Like in this one, the therapist can't seem to ditch this, the, uh, the patient. Yeah. In anger <laughs> management, the patient can't ditch the therapist. And both of them win over the two people, or win over the most important people in their lives. Yeah, I've, I've, I almost forgot about the scene in Anger Management where he literally hides from Buddy in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was the reason for the whole mom ruse too. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, I feel like we should end it here, or you may never stop. Yeah. Oh, wait, there's one more moment in Good Morning America I forgot. Mm. It's, it's just a very, very quick reaction shot. It's when um, the, be- the beginning scene, uh, the, the, the beginning of the scene before, when he's like, where is my toothbrush? And then he just starts to brush his teeth with his finger. And then we don't talk about that again. Mm-hmm. And then in the middle of the interview, in mid interview, he finds out where his toothbrush went. <laughs> yeah, it's like just that one little reaction show. <laughs> oh God! So um, yeah, uh, I think that's is that about it. <laughs> I think so. I said I feel like there's more, but this is basically this might as well just be the gist of how I feel about what about. <laughs> So there that is. Um, yes. Okay. Is that it?
Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we don't know what um, this will be going out with about. There, there's going to be like, there's like three videos that are going to go out like at kind of the same time. This one and two others. Mm -hmm. And then we are starting the King thing uh, in the next couple of days or so. Um, so I don't think we know what our next one is, but I'm sure we'll figure that out. No, and don't you have a uh, like a special video coming out? Yeah, I think I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that one first. Then there's um, a, there'll be a video on the new Bill and Ted, and then I think I'll do this one. They'll be in that they'll be in that order, but they'll be like they'll probably be up like around the same. They'll go up around the same time. Huh. And then our uh, and then yeah. So uh, I guess we will figure out what the next one is. Uh, but we should be getting, the channel should be getting a lot busier now than it has been now that we're going to kind of start getting back into a steady vibe and steady new releases are going to start coming out. Um, we're getting close to October where we're going to be, like, I already have October almost fully planned. So, it's, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so until all that stuff, is that it? I think so. All right.